The night, the part of the day dedicated to rest, is the moment when everything is at peace, where the body replenishes itself for a new day. After an exhausting day, Elizabeth got into bed expecting nothing more than to rest, sleep, dream. But as the night progressed, that day an intruder managed to enter her room and stole her peace and that of her parents with a single blow. Today I will tell you about the ordeal that sweet Elizabeth went through and survived to become a great example for society all over the world. The day of the celebration. It was an apparent day of celebration that Wednesday, June 5, 2002, as the end of school celebration for Bryan Middle School had taken place. The Smart family returned satisfied from the event. The exhausted kids went to bed. Edward, the father, checked the doors of the house to sleep peacefully. However, he didn't set the alarm, as the kids often got up at midnight to go to the bathroom, and it would sound very loud, scaring everyone but no one thought that if they had activated that security method, the story would have been very different. Elizabeth, the teenage daughter of the Smarts, was only 14 years old. She was born on November 3rd, 1987 in Salt Lake City, Utah. She was the second of six siblings in the family. Her parents, Edward and Louise Smart, raised their children under the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That girl, like any other with values, was very dedicated and sensitive. In addition, she loved to listen to music and play as well, as she had a great skill with the harp. The house she lived in was big, however, as they were several children, she shared the room with her little sister. Mary Catherine, age nine. That day, the girls went to their room and after a chat between sisters, they got into bed and prepared to sleep. It was around 2.30 in the morning. Elizabeth woke up abruptly, feeling a pressure on her throat. It was sharp, and it was a knife. The girl opened her eyes and managed to make out a white man, with dark hair and a large beard on his face. Moreover, he was fully dressed in black. Frightened, Elizabeth managed to exclaim in pain, but immediately the kidnapper whispered in her ear to be quiet, to stay still and not to scream, as he threatened to harm her if she did not obey. Mary, her sister, also managed to wake up, but scared, she pretended to be asleep. The voice of that man was also familiar to her. The man quickly forced the teenager to leave the house. The younger sister continued to watch what was happening with half-open eyes, very careful not to be caught, as she was terrified with fear. Mary heard the footsteps moving away from her presence. Not hearing any calls, the girl ran to hide under the bed. There she waited for about two hours as the impact of the events had her in shock. Moreover, it crossed her mind that that man could come back for her too. Then the young girl finally reacted and ran to her parents' room to tell them what had happened. But by then, it's assumed that the kidnapper already had a significant advantage. The girl told her parents that a bearded man had taken her older sister. The father, between being asleep and awake, didn't understand because that, I tell you, took him by surprise. They thought the little girl had had a nightmare. The girl's blood pressure plummeted while in the girl's room. Well, Elizabeth wasn't there. What Mary said was true. He searched the other rooms in the house, even downstairs, but there was no trace of his little one. When he was on the first floor, he noticed that the window screen was damaged, and at that point, he fully woke up and realized that his daughter was gone. She had been kidnapped. Anxious not to waste any more time, he called 911 by that time it was 4 in the morning. As the hours passed, the police alerted about the disappearance of Elizabeth. The news began to circulate on television and radio. In addition, the family began to offer a reward of about $250,000 and an additional $10,000 to anyone who could provide information on the young woman's whereabouts. A group of volunteers joined this cause. Around 700 people, plus 25 police officers and FBI members led this search. 
The authorities began to receive many leads. They had calls one after another. Unfortunately, they were not relevant, nor did they come close to finding Elizabeth. In the Smiths' minds, there was no explanation for what had happened to a member of their family. These people were very compassionate and often succumbed to helping those most in need. However, with the confidence of their actions of doing good, they never imagined that one day a wolf in sheep's clothing would come into their life, as the saying goes. Definitely, there are steps that, looking back, we would not have wanted to take. I'm referring exactly to what happened to the matriarch of this family, and here's why I say this. It was an autumn afternoon in the year 2001. Luis was walking with his daughter Elizabeth in the city center. Suddenly, a man begging for alms crossed their path. The woman silently waited. Elizabeth was moved by this man's poverty. Mrs. Smith approached the beggar and chatted with him for a moment. He told her his name was Emmanuel. He seemed clean and his face was well shaven. The woman felt pity and gave him a $5 bill. She offered him a job to earn some extra money, to which the man replied that, of course. Luis told her that he needed to repair the roof of his house. Emmanuel agreed, and they decided that he would do the job in November. That's how that vagabond managed to sneak into the Smart's house, spending a long time fixing the roof. But, with the usual trust, no one noticed what that man was planning to do with the family's second daughter. What was coming was something opposite to all the good that family did for the community. I'll tell you about the relationship I'm talking about. So, just a few minutes after being taken from her room, Elizabeth was being dragged by her kidnapper down the dark street, when suddenly a police car passes by them. The man immediately points the knife threatening the girl, whispering to her that if she moved, he would kill her right there. The young girl remained silent, recognizing her abductor. Yes, it was that vagabond her mother had rescued, the one who had been repairing the roof. The man forced the young girl to climb up a nearby mountain. It was very dark and nothing could be seen. After walking a long distance, they arrived at an improvised camp in the midst of many large trees. Wanda Barsi was waiting for them at the place. None other than the partner of this man, who they believed was named Emmanuel. The truth is that his name was Brian David Mitchell. The deranged individual proclaimed himself as a preacher of the word of God and called himself Isaiah. That same morning, Wanda, seemingly just as unhinged, conducted a ceremony in which she married Mitchell and little Elizabeth. With this, you realize they were completely toasted. What followed was even worse than everything that had come before for the man. The man had told him it was time to fulfill the commitment. The teenager didn't know what these words referred to. Elizabeth seemed to be living in another reality, very different from her life just a day ago. Less than five kilometers from her community, she managed to hear voices of people looking for her. On the other hand, Mitchell, supposedly enlightened by divine revelations, expressed his desire to live for 300 years. Wanda started searching for her wife among her 250 wives at home. So yes, he began to force her into intimacy. These acts were repeated up to four times a day. Then they chained her to the trees. There, she suffered from hunger and cold. These people gave her trash to eat. And at other times, they would get her drunk and force her to watch adult content. And this last thing was something daily. Elizabeth was starting to lose her mind. The fear that man instilled in her, with the constant threat that if she tried to escape or ask for help, he would take her life. Mitchell, I tell you, abused the little girl in a tent that the couple called Emmanuel's altar. The dynamic was the same. On one occasion, the couple made the girl drink so much that she vomited. They left her there all night. The next day, she was still unable to get up. This generated senseless mockery. It was insatiable and in an evil way on the part of her captors. It seemed as though the suffering of poor Elizabeth fed and satisfied them in some way. After three months in September of 2002, the three of them boarded a bus on the way to California. They were heading to the city of San Diego. While there, they constantly moved between camps and shelters for people without resources who usually ate in these same places for the need of food. In the middle of the journey, Mitchell tried to kidnap another girl, but luckily he did not succeed. Elizabeth was passed from one place to another. Often in public places, her captors would dress her in white clothes and put a veil on her face, so no one paid attention to the girl. In the same way, she never dared to ask for help 
because as I told you, she was horrified by Mitchell and his death threats. Simultaneously, Mitchell remained in jail while the girl's family persisted in the search for her amidst her torment. They were living a real hell, as thousands of things were assumed without knowing anything about her. On June 14, the police arrested the first suspect in the case, Richard Ritchie, 48 years old. This criminal, who was on parole, had worked at the Smarts house. He had stolen jewelry and money from them, and had done the same in other houses in the neighborhood. However, Ritchie claimed to know nothing about the teenager, and they didn't believe him. Then, on July 24, 2002, the police were called to the house of Louise Smart's sister. 15-year-old Olivia Wright woke up due to noises. She saw a man trying to cut the mosquito netting of her window. The girl reacted immediately, and the man ran away. The neighbor's fear heightened, worried that Richie was in the area. The fear of the neighbors in this place became very present, as they feared, for example, that Richie was in the neighborhood. The fear of the neighbors in this place became very present, as they feared, for example, that Richie was in the neighborhood. That, on the other hand, despite the situation that was happening in the Smart family, the boys, Elizabeth's brothers, had to go back to school in August and continue with their life. They resumed school in August, the same month Richie, the suspect, had a stroke and died. Despite this, the police still thought he could be the culprit. Later, in October, the desperate family pressed so hard that they reached President Bush. This character pushed for the implementation of alert systems for missing children. Which, on the other hand, I tell you, everything seemed to be going downhill. The family knew nothing about Elizabeth. The main suspect had died and the daily routine reduced the suffering into resignation. And at this point, after four months, the terror that Mary had gone through had already clouded her memory and was fading away. The youngest of the sisters then began to recall that night and that voice. Of course, that voice was the beggars who fixed the roof before the December dates. The girl told her parents all the details, and they, filled with a certain hope, went to the police and right there a composite sketch of the suspect was made. But they wouldn't have much success in finding her. Moreover, they didn't know her real name. By then, Mitchell had already moved to another city with Wanda and Elizabeth. On the other hand, amidst the anxiety of finding Elizabeth, her parents remember her 15th birthday. The family was desperate. In their search for her, five months had already passed without hearing her voice, seeing her smile, or even hearing her play her harp. The pain was already unbearable. And in January 2003, Mary and her four siblings appeared on a television interview hosted by Jane Clayson, anchor of CBS's 48 Hours Investigates. The Smarts knew they had to broaden their options to find their daughter. So on February 3rd, the family decides to publish the sketch of this individual, who they believed at that time was named Emmanuel. The announcement brings it directly to the attention of the America's Most Wanted program, hosted by John Walsh. This man had personally experienced the loss of his son Adam after his kidnapping went wrong. I've already made a video for you. You can already find it on Facebook and YouTube. Dive in there, but return. Just after this broadcast of the program showing the suspect's face, the phone started to ring. Mitchell's stepchildren identified him and immediately revealed his name. It was Brian David Mitchell. Hopes of finding him became huge, as now the whole country knew his face and his name. At the same time, the psychopathic couple was already planning to move to Boston or New York. The young woman intercedes by telling them that God would want them to return to their hometown, this in Salt Lake City. And as if it were a miracle, the couple agreed with the young woman and decided to return by hitchhiking. Once in the state of Utah, specifically in Sandy, two local couples locate these criminals with the teenager. They were carrying sleeping bags, wearing wigs, and the women were also wearing dirty veils. The first couple, Nancy and Rudy Montoya, fans of this television program, saw Mitchell and immediately called 911. That program, as I was telling you in that video, was quite popular. It had more than 10 million viewers. In addition, Elizabeth's case had been extended to two episodes. The good news, thanks to this program, arrived on March 12, 2003, at one in the afternoon. The police save Elizabeth from the hands of her kidnapper and the minor, well, she's alive. That day, she was taken to a police unit straight to the station in her neighborhood in Salt Lake City, 
where her family was anxious and justice was waiting for her, which on the other hand, well yes, would take a while to arrive. But the important thing was that the girl would now be safe. By November 16, 2009, several years had passed. After a series of separate exams to evaluate the mental health of the accused and determine whether they were fit to stand trial, Wanda Percy reached an agreement to plead guilty for collaborating in the kidnapping and publicly apologized to the family that by May 2010, the judge handed down her sentence of no less than 15 years in prison. On the other hand, Mitchell was tried on charges of kidnapping and repeated assault abuses, and the man was also diagnosed with personality disorders, as he was antisocial and narcissistic. Emmanuel, as he called himself, showed a problematic attitude from a young age. His parents sent him to live with his grandmother. His first marriage happened at 19, where he had his first two children. In 81, he married for the second time to a woman who had three daughters. The man always talked about Satan, even abused his stepdaughters, and ended up separating after his wife realized what was happening. Soon after, his third marriage came with Wanda, who was divorced and had six children. That marriage, well, you know, was total madness. In the 90s, the man who had been a Mormon from the beginning broke with the church and announced supposed apocalyptic visions. Wanda called herself a worshiper of God and followed him like a disciple. Then he conceived the kidnapping idea, and you're aware of the subsequent events. Elizabeth, at the time of the trial, was on a Mormon mission in Paris. He returned to visit his hometown. She wanted to give her statement of what happened. The nine months those nine most horrible months of her entire life. The woman detailed the abuses and inhumane conditions she was forced to live in. She also recounted that she once came close to being rescued in a bookstore by a detective, but admitted that she was so scared that she couldn't ask for help. Wanda also testified against Michelle. She said that he expressed a desire to kidnap young women and described how he prepared the camp to receive Elizabeth. On that day, Michelle would be sentenced on December 11, 2010. The jury found Brian David Mitchell guilty of kidnapping with the intent to engage the minor in sexual activities that were consummated and sentenced him to life imprisonment to be served in a high security prison in the state of Arizona. On the other hand, Wanda was released from jail on parole. This happened in September of the year 2018. And when this occurred, Elizabeth was 30 years old and made the following comment. I sincerely believe she is a threat. This is about a woman who had six children and yet conspired to kidnap a 14-year-old girl, and not only sat next to her while she was being abused, but also encouraged her husband to continue raping me. She sat next to me while he was raping me, and one side of her body was touching mine, so there was no secret. She knew what was happening. She was twisted, evil. Elizabeth managed to recover from all the aftermath that kidnapping left on her. The woman never stayed quiet or calm. She was a survivor, a warrior who also on March 8, 2006, spoke to the United States Congress to support a law against these abusers and the implementation of the Amber Alert, the current protocol that is implemented when a minor is missing. Moreover, Elizabeth didn't remain silent. In 2011, she founded the Elizabeth Smart Foundation to fight against abuse and sexual violence. Her help was always to provide psychological support post-abuse, which at the same time in 2003 she published her book, My Story, where she recounts her memories. There were also movies, documentaries, and more books based on her impressive story and how she became a warrior. Currently, she is determined to be Valor. Her experience is there to help any woman who has gone through any type of abuse, and in this way, learn to love and value herself above all things after the storm. But, if you liked this video, don't forget to follow me on my social networks, and remember that you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Patreon. What else? Nothing else? Yes, I think that's all. You can follow me on all social networks and see you tomorrow or Monday in a new video.